Okay, so what do you do when you get to a rack down? So I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to approach this. We did have more alarms, but they're starting to clear. I'm gonna treat this like a rack down, hoping that maybe people will learn something. Not really sure how I'm gonna approach this video, but I know there's gonna be some theory, some pen and paper, and some physical stuff. We'll just go through it and see how it ends up. not going to be exhaustive okay this is just you know I'm trying to come up with some type of guide like if you're a new guy and you gotta kind of you know figure out one of these rack down things what do you kind of start with so I put together a loose list here I'm gonna post it below and we're just gonna kind of go through it in an abstract like overview on what we're doing and and uh, yeah we'll just go through as I go through it and, and you'll see what I mean First up is power okay do you have a line voltage and do you have control voltage okay and then after that is the phase monitor okay these are the two things we're just going to look at quick and uh so i've gone to stores where they've shut off their own control voltage by accident i've gone to stores where the control voltage has rubbed out and you know you just kind of get a vision for it this typically like i'm not going to pull out my uh you know my my voltmeter for this because it's you know it's pretty intuitive if you got compressors running and contact is pulling in more than likely you have control voltage but you might not have control voltage to everything but you know we're just going to give it a quick look and we'll start with that all right so i'm right here you can hear the compressors are running right so there's definitely line voltage okay we're going to do a quick check in here now the second one is the phase monitor you see this thing right so phase average and it gives it 477 okay yellow light going good if there was an alarm there it would say fault sometimes if you get like a phase loss and now you have it back you have to reset that phase monitor or shut down your whole rack number two on checking the voltage is over here this is usually where your control voltage is there's some type of control breaker in there like such check if these are tripped okay and another you know red flag on this is if no contactors are pulling in, but you have line voltage, and none of these lights over there are, if none of those lights are on, you don't have control voltage, okay? Or sometimes if we have oil tracks like we do today, you won't have control voltage at those as well. Up is kind of a two first. So I put it as 2.5 because if I'm honest, it's just kind of, it's a hard thing to do with a rack that's not running. So if you come to a rack that is just like dead stalled, okay, it is a hard thing to do. You don't necessarily know if it has low refrigerant because the whole rack might be off, okay? So that's why it's like a two-point fiber is it's something you have to keep in your brain through the entire troubleshooting process. Like, is this rack low? So as you reset alarms or, or as the rack starts recovering or whatever you gotta do, you gotta kinda have in your mind is there low refrigerant? Because in all honesty, about a third to half of all the calls are just low refrigerant. Um, but it can, if you don't have enough refrigerant, it can mimic uh, a lot of these other ones, which is oil failure or low suction or you know some of these other things, right? So you gotta keep that in your mind, but it's not really the next thing that you do. Because if your rack isn't running right, you can't really know that you have low refrigerant, but if you don't have low, low, if you don't have enough refrigerant, your rack isn't running right. So like, it's kind of a darned if you do and darned if you don't type of scenario. So that's why I just say keep it on your mind, brain. And as soon as you can check that low refrigerant, you got to check it. Um, I'm gonna attach below. I have a couple low checking refrigerant guides. I also have like a sight glass guide. I'll put that below just to kind of give you an idea on how to check it and uh, some signs and symptoms and I'm going to probably go over that. I think I'm going to add some pen and paper to this and we'll see how in depth I go. So the one after this is what alarms are showing on the rack. Now not the controller, the rack, because the controller is going to be different. So you can see right there that we got oil failure, oil failure, and oil failure going off right there. Okay, so we have three oil failures going off currently. Nothing else is going off. I mean, there's a high suction alarm for um, for downstairs at the controller, so we know that there's not enough compressors running in order to create what we need. So now we're just going to kind of look at the oil troubleshooting one. 
Oil failure, I made a rough outline. I might edit it and make it a little bit better. And when we go over the pen and paper, I might kind of explain a little bit better. But first off, what compressors are out of oil? Does one compressor look more filled up than the others? It's so common that a compressor fails, fills up with oil. Is there oil in the oil reservoir? Is the oil line warm? Is the oil separator or turbo shed? Pressure differential across it, right? Does the check valve work? Is there a pressure differential across the oil filter? Is there signs of flood back? And then we have the last one, which is the float screen. Which that one, the reason I have it in blue is it's gonna be really unlikely if you have an oil float that your rack's gonna be down from one compressor. That would be kind of a more of a single compressor thing, but there are some racks that are only two compressors out there. So if you get one compressor down because your oil floats, it has a clogged screen, then yeah. But anyway, so we're just gonna kind of run through that quick here while I'm doing this, and we'll kind of knuckle it down better on the pen and paper. All right, so I'm right here, I'm looking. Compressor one, empty. See, empty. Compressor two, empty. Compressor three, not bad. Compressor three's running, but it's not overfilled. Compressor four, empty. Compressor five, empty. Compressor six, empty. Is that empty or full? That's full. That's very full. Okay. It's the fullest one and it doesn't have any type of signal of running. And that's off of it. So that's interesting. So we're going to note that and we're going to keep moving forward. Here's another compressor. Okay, that looks a little dangerous there. Uh, that one also looks very, very full. And that one also doesn't look like it's the most active as well. So which ones are the most full is these last two compressors, okay? And we're gonna take a quick look. So currently, those are all on. But before the last one is, uh, actually let me count them, let me just make sure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, so the last two compressors are off currently. The last two are off on there, all right? So now we have to see, well, okay, they could be gobbling up the oil, and um, is it, are they, uh, what's it called? Are they isolated correctly? Well, this one right here, the discharge isn't isolated. The suction isn't isolated as well, right? So is the oil isolated at least? <laughs> money's on that it's probably not oh right here that looks pretty open to me so i'm pretty sure that that's just uh that's just gobbling up all the oil this one over here might be too let's take a let's take a quick look i care on this one about the suction i don't know why that one's turned off we might need to dig into that a bit later i have a compressor guide by the way maybe i'll put that in there too below this one's isolated properly, so that one, at least, the suction is. So I'm going to have to dig into these compressors. So right now, my opinion is this is isol this is in isolated, not this is not isolated properly, okay? So what happens is, well, part of what happens is, right, the refrigerant oil will slowly kind of drip down the suction side over time, and it will just gravitate at this compressor, right? This compressor is not running because it's turned off. As you see up there, it's turned off in those two places. So what will happen with time is this compressor will suck up all the oil on the rack and starve all the other compressors of any kind of oil. So the only way to fix it is by pushing the oil out of the compressor. So we're gonna have to do that. Now we're gonna come over here and we're gonna also kind of show you. So this rack's a little different than what I've wrote it for. So this rack has an oil separator right there. Is there oil in it? Nope, there's no oil. So as far as I'm concerned, it seems like my theory is holding water pretty good. Now, just to show you for the practical side, this is your oil separator. So what you would do is you would, if you want to take a pressure differential across it, there's a float in the bottom of that oil filter, an oil separator right there. Sometimes those float get clogged with, you know, debris or non-condensable, well, not non-condensable, debris typically from years of running the rack. So what you would do is you would feel here and you would feel that this line is warm. If it's cool, okay, or cold, a lot of the time that means that that oil separator is not feeding properly. 
But if you, one of your compressors is gobbling up all your oil, that's why we start with that, this line's gonna feel cold because that float only activates if you have oil to actually push through here. So if you don't have any oil to push through the line, it's gonna feel cold. So that's why I always check my compressors first to see if anyone, because let me tell you, the longer you live in this trade, okay, people don't isolate compressors properly. It's just a thing. People don't do it. Assuming that your friend or your coworker will, they don't do it. They're not gonna do it. You're gonna be out on call. They're not gonna do it. People don't isolate compressors properly. And this seems to be another case of that. So this is cool right now, but my theory is it's because this compressor is, um, what's the word for it? It's filled with oil. And there's not enough oil to actually feed. But you would follow that feed to your oil reservoir. And in this rack, oh, there is a check valve on this oil reservoir. You can check if that check valve works right there. Now I have a video on how to check that and how to change the check valve. I'll post that video below and I'll explain it a bit in uh, the pen and paper as well. Now there's your oil filter. You can take a pressure differential across the oil filter. So you take a pressure differential, you would hook up here and then you could hook up right there. And that would give you your pressure differential across it. So you, what you want is you don't want any pressure differential or anything. I think I have a video for anything under five. I'll also post my oil filter changing video as well. If you want to have that as, you know, whatever. And I'll go over in the pen and paper as well. And then you can also check, obviously check hand valves, make sure the hand valves are open. And from there, that oil line will just go to your oil tracks over there. Okay? But so that seems to be, in my opinion, it seems to be this compressor. So I'm gonna hook up to this compressor, I'm gonna pump the oil out of it. And then while it's doing that, we're gonna go over the other things on the system that I wanna go over and we're gonna go over the other principles. And also just to mention, if you were to take a pressure differential across this, you would have to hook up on this side. I can't even view it. This side of it and then the top side of it. Anywhere along it. So you could hook up along that suction header and then along where that discharge goes anywhere to kind of get a differential across it. Some of them even actually have, um, what's that thing called? Has their own little gauge on it. I'll, I'll show it at some point. Now also, you can see the sight glass up there, right? You wanna be concerned with your refrigerant level. Now, that refrigerant level doesn't look great, okay? It could just be a low load condition currently, but you have to check the uh, the receiver to make sure. And in all honesty, it could be both because I know for a fact that that oil is a problem right now. In my opinion, that is 100% the problem. Uh, but now we're just going to check over here. You can see that on this old thing, you can see that there's a little, there's like no, I would say that's probably empty. So we probably don't have enough refrigerant in this either. So realistically, we kind of have to solve both of these issues. Number three is, you know, the last one on number three. And so, you know, we have this oil failure. I just wanted to mention this one here. Kind of going out of order, but it is what it is. Look at your rack pressures and trends. So you can see right here, your condensing pressure is maintaining capacity, okay? And there's two fans running, all right? And then your suction pressure is uh, not right at all. You can see that's way too high. And so that, so what I'm gonna do is I am going to fix the, uh, I'm going to fix the compressor situation first and the reason why I'm gonna do that is because let's see if my brain will work here the reason I want to do that is because there's a, there's a possibility that the low refrigerant is claw is caused by the fact that we can't get this value down to where it needs to go so I know that it's working well enough that there doesn't seem to be any alarms other than the high pressure and the suction so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna solve this issue and then reevaluate the low uh, refrigerant issue. And realistically, almost all of our stores could always just use 50 pounds of refrigerant anyway. So, but anyway, we're gonna keep moving. All right, yeah, so I uh, am pushing the oil out of this compressor. So I have a couple videos on doing this. I'll post my one that I'm doing, which for the scroll compressors. Um, but I'm pushing the oil out. So what I went through and I did 
is I'm going through and I'm pulling the compressors that have the most amount of oil in them. Uh, you know, for an oil tracks, you know, you just pull this thing out, pop it back in. That's it. That's how you reset them. They're not rocket science. Um, but if you don't know that, you're going to be stuck at a store till 6 in the morning. That's what happened to me when I first started. I had no idea how these things work. But anyway, so I'm getting as many compressors as I can get to run as possible to get this system moving. And uh, pumping the oil out. But while we're doing that, we'll go back to the checklist. And uh, we'll, we'll go through everything and, and, and take a look at how things are doing. All right, so next up is high discharge, right? So we're going to look at some of the symptoms of high discharge. We're going to run through that quick. Uh, th that one's actually kind of easy. And obviously, so I wrote in the beginning also, uh, when doing this, keep into account whether it's super hot or super cold. Because sometimes there's actually some niche issues that happens when it's super hot or super cold. Um, but anyway, we'll get into that later. So obviously, you know, we're going to go check the dis you know, the high discharge pressure. So the first thing that you would do is check the condensers, okay? So you come on here and you just take a look. Now, you can see this condenser's junk, uh, absolute junk. Like this is, this is how you know you have a bad condenser, okay? This condenser's junk. It's terrible. Um, it's awful. But, you know, it, currently it, it's not the issue. We know what the issue is already. But... So you would take a look and you would see, is it plugged and is it junk? Well, it's junk, okay? But don't just stop there. Next up is, are the fans running, right? So what you would do is you just climb up on top and you would look at the controller. How many fans does the controller say is supposed to be running and how many fans are actually running, okay? So, you know, you would literally just, let's see if I can do it one-handed. Oh, I'm not as young as I used to be. Oh, up here all right and you just check check them all just make sure that they're running all right okay and then from there what you can do is you know you can obviously go into the actual component box look up are there any fuses blown if you have any reasons to believe so if all the compress if all the fans are running then it's like okay well all the fans are running Right, but if you see that some of the fans are not running and it's calling for it, now you have some type of issue. It could be a fan's blown out, it could be the fuses are blown, whatever it happens to be, okay? So the next step from there would be a couple of them, which is one is restricted filter dryer. So, you know, on the rack you have a filter dryer and I've actually, I've gone to a rack that has had, and I wish I had a YouTube channel when I found this, okay? That filter dryer right there, 33 PSI pressure differential from one side to the other. So that means that the, the discharge pressure was 30 PSI above, uh, above what was actually going out to the cases, okay? And that would cause you to trip on a high discharge. The last one, well not the last one, but another good one is, this is not an exhaustive list, this is just a pretty good list okay another pretty good one is I'm just checking on there another pretty good one and you can see that they're all starting to just a side note you can see that that as the oil is pushing out of this compressor there going into the suction okay you can see filled up now well that one was already filled up filled up filled up filled up filled up filled up it's all working good now I just got to wait for the rest of the oil congratulations we figured it out but anyway, so now you would also want to look for um, ball valves. So are any of the discharges closed on the compressors? And if they are, is it correspond to a compressor that's shut down, okay? Is there some type of valve that might have been closed along the discharge? And other than that, you know, there might be some other niche things, but for the most part, that's a really good high discharge list. Last one on this rack, you know, Rack alarm list is high suction, okay? This is this is a really good one here. So we kind of already went through, are all compressors operating? Well, we actually didn't go through that because technically, so if you were to come here and you were to see that there's no oil failures, um, but one of your compressors isn't operating correctly, you know, that compressor could be not operating because of a discharge failure, an oil failure, all kinds of things but are all compressors operating correctly? So we actually had this alarm, which was the high suction, but that part of this troubleshooting was already addressed up here 
in the oil failure aspect. So the compressors were not running because of the oil failure. Now the next one is touching the rack. This is really important and we're gonna go through and I'll show you how to do that. And the last one is, is the subcooler working? So sometimes on low temperature applications during a really hot day in the summer, you will get a high suction because you're because you need that subcooler to be working in order for your circuit to satisfy. That might be I might explain that in the pen and paper. I I will attach below um, my subcoolers explained in 35 minutes, and I'll also attach my subcooler playlist below. I think I have five videos on subcoolers and their different uh, variations, and they're also known as an economizer. So I'll change that to the guide to slash economizer and I might update this guide a little bit before posting it below um, as well. But anyway, we're gonna get through that right now. We're gonna go over 3C.2, which is touching the rack. So again, as I mentioned, this is not a comprehensive thing. This is just what I do at a typical rack down and I usually find the issue within you know an hour, typically, okay? So you just go through. Is it supposed to be hot, the discharge? Touch the discharge, hot. Hot, 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 and you just go through every compressor. Is it hot? They're all hot. Well, these ones are cool because those compressors are isolated. And let's see, is that still pushing it out? It's still pushing it out. I wish I was using discharge instead of liquid. Discharge works better. Then you go through. Is it cold? Touch the, 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 the suction side. Cold, 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 cold cold and why are you doing this because sometimes you'll get a compressor that its reed valves are broken or the compressor is busted or the, the pistons are cockeyed or something's wrong with it and now you have discharge feeding back through the compressor into the suction causing the suction pressure to raise the pressure so you go through and you just touch it that's all you got to do now this is another really good one is you go through and you touch your suctions over here okay are your suctions warm cold 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 and why do you do this because sometimes especially on low temperature racks you'll get a hot gas valve that'll just stay open and you'll actually get so you want to touch every single suction line okay and you want to touch the suction headers as well because you're going to sometimes you get a hot gas valve that's stuck open and it will feed it all the way across the store right back in your rack and your rack is never satisfying because you're getting this hot gas dumped directly into it, causing your high suction. So some people, I've had friends of mine take compressors and they're isolating compressor after compressor after compressor because they feel, oh, this is hot. This is hot. This is hot. And they go, there must be a compressor blowing by. Before you do that, check all the suctions and try to see, is there a hot gas valve blowing by? And you want to check every single suction, okay? every single suction all right if you find that your suction header is super hot check everything back from the cases and then go back to your compressors and then you gotta you know unfortunately you gotta start isolating them and try to figure out what compressor is causing it but anyway we'll kind of get more into that with the pen and paper hopefully i explain that decently now from here what you do is i'm going to touch some other things as i mentioned earlier the oil line now that the oil is flowing right oh that's warm that's nice and warm now okay i know that that's that that's okay now that oil line is all right it's feeding oil okay i wanted to check to make sure that i was doing that still don't have a any oil in the in the reservoir so we're going to leave it longer but is it is this warm this isn't going to be as warm but right here that's pretty warm because this goes back to the oil separator i just want to make sure does it seem to be all right you might even want to check you know for instance here's my condenser this is another really good one right here okay this is my discharge is my discharge warm yes this is my condensed liquid is it cold yes is it colder than the discharge yes it is now this is my liquid you know coming out goes into the you know coming out of my receiver is the liquid coming out of the receiver cold or cooler yes it is warm warm hot hot all right and you just want to go through and literally touch everything. Touch every hot gas valve. Touch every compressor. You know, do, do all that good stuff, okay? And just go through. Is it supposed to be hot? Yes. Is it hot? 
Is it supposed to be cold? Yes. Is it cold? Is it supposed to be warm? Yeah. Is it warm? That's what you do. And a lot of the times you'll catch a lot of these discharge issues dumping back into your suction. So we have four, well, no, sorry, three now, what I would call, you know, conditions that aren't normal. Okay. They're just, they just happen. They're not normal. They, they do different things. Okay. They're just, there's just peculiar conditions. Extreme heat. I have serviced many stores that they are not, their condensers are not priced, sized properly and the condensers are at the end of their lives. Okay. So now they can't reject the heat fast enough. So they will just go off on high discharge pressure every single hot day. Every, every day over 95, we drive to the store at nighttime, we set all the compressors and the rack recovers overnight. And then we do the next thing the next day, okay? Extreme heat conditions, sometimes it happens. Unfortunately, you know, they didn't engineer it right. They didn't put in the high heat strategies. It is what it is. There's nothing you can really do about it. And you gotta learn the stores that that's the case yourself. There's nothing that can be done about that. But if you're at a store on a 95 degree day, every single head fan, you know, every single condenser fan's working, your condenser looks great, your compressors look fine, every other test passed, your oil's working right, everything's working fine, but your head pressure's like 324, and it's just hovering there, your condenser's too small and your load's too big. Okay, so what's the solution to this? In all honesty, the only solution is either keep resetting it, or you're gonna have to close, you're gonna have to remove some of that load. So a solution to it would be, I'm sorry, Mr. Manager, your cake case has to shut down. Your your five doors of frozen food has to shut down. Okay, we have to free up that load because our system can't handle it. You have to allow your system to do it. And depending on the stores, we've had stores where they've had like five cases shut down for a month because they their stores just couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle it. So they had like five cases shut, like five, like a whole lineup of frozen food shut down for half the summer because their condensers were junk and they would rather at least sell most of their stuff rather than have us come to the store every day and babysit and lose product. So anyway, extreme heat conditions, that's the way to do it. Extreme cold conditions. this extreme cold conditions, what you can do is so if you add refrigerant to the system, so what happens is, you know, your refrigerant is stuck at your condenser, right? It's stuck up there. So what happens is you have such low load conditions that um, your refrigerant condenses in the condenser and it stalls. So what will actually happen is your compressors will turn off on low suction because it can't circulate the refrigerant. Your head pressure is so low and then all your your um, solenoid valves are closed so everything just stacks up at the rack and you can't you can't get it to flow it won't flow and, and what, what happens is your rack stalls so you know there's a couple ways of approaching this so one of them is you know obviously follow your epa guidelines if you need to put in you know a seasonal adjustment into some type of you know chart or something do that if you need to reach out for permission you know from the authority um, you know, the jurisdiction having an authority, whatever you have to do. If you add in some refrigerant to your system, you know, like, you know, with these larger systems, you know, like if you have like a 500 pound system and you add, you know, 20 pounds of gas or something or 10 pounds of gas, um, what will happen is that gas will, it will also stack at the condenser, but it will raise the pressure at the condenser causing the refrigerant to flow down into the cases. Or if you can heat up the refrigerant somehow, um, like I've seen guys um, bring them into the store and put them in a bucket of hot water, let them sit for a little bit. Or, um, you know, some guys I, I worked with, their trucks actually had climate control where their tanks were. And uh, that wasn't common, but it was like a passenger vehicle that was retrofit to be a, um, a tool vehicle you know, like a uh, service van. So it actually had the AC in the back. So they would turn on the heat in the back, you know, while their tanks were secure in the back, you know, you know, um, Department of Transportation Safety and all that. But while they were secure in the back, they would turn on the heat and it would raise, you know, the temperature of the tanks to like 50, 60 degrees. And now you have 50 to 60 degree refrigerant going into your system with all that heat energy rather than having, you know, negative five degree refrigerant 
you know, sitting up at your condenser. Because I'm talking, when I'm talking cold, I'm talking like, um, you know, like there were days where, you know, my boss said, hey, we're going to have negative 10. We need you to stay in a hotel up in this area because every single one of these racks are going to crash. And they know that. And so, okay. So you need to, you know, prepare accordingly. Um, so that is one method of doing it. Um, is you can add refrigerant to it as a seasonal adjustment. Um, now, you you know obviously leak check, make sure there's no leaks or whatever, and that you're not you know you're not violating any EPA guidelines. Another way to do it is you can rack is you can wrap the condenser. So what you do is you go up, you put a tarp over the condenser, and unfortunately I don't really I, you know I wasn't able to show you, but you can put a tarp over it and wrap it. And what it'll do is it'll it'll prevent air from blowing through the condenser and it'll artificially raise um, the head pressure of the condenser. And that will allow your refrigerant to kind of boil off, create enough pressure to flow properly down to the floor. Now, another way to do it is you can actually turn up the heat in your store. You can ask your manager and say, hey, can we go from 68 to 75 or 74 and what that will do is it'll create such a higher load in the store that it will heat your condenser up and keep your condenser from stalling because the store is so much warmer now also we've actually had locations in stores where we put doors on their their medium temp produce because there was some initiative you know put doors on the produce and you'll government will give you money or whatever they do and so they put all these doors on it and you know they saved a couple bucks and they found when the winter came it would just stall over and over again because now the rack was so oversized because they didn't appropriately um they didn't appropriately load the system anymore the system was for cases that didn't have doors but now they had doors the load was so small that we actually had to go back and remove the doors for winter time in order to make enough load so the condition so the refrigeration system actually flowed properly um so you know you need to think okay what are my problem stores you know um you know and you and you have to like plan accordingly um, you know, like if you, if it's going to be a zero degree day and you know certain stores might need a seasonal adjustment, um, you may have to pick up refrigerant or whatever you need to do. Um, let your manager know, you know, and, and, you know, plan accordingly, pack a couple tops in your truck, um, whatever you need. But so low ambient, extreme low ambience is, uh, is definitely its own thing. When you start getting below 10 degrees, um, it's, it really gets wild. And then, uh, this year, um, there was even a, a well, it was last year, technically in like January, February or something, there was a day out where I am, where we had negative 40, uh, it was like negative 40 with winds, you know, uh, it, it was comfortably like negative 20, like no wind, negative 40 wind chill. And, uh, pretty much, uh, every location in one of the States that the company I work for had to shut down. So like. There, it, you know, there are some scenarios where it's like, you know, <laughs> some some racks were just not built to work in those conditions. Um, but anyway, and then springtime issues is the last kind of exception, which is the rack will go in and out of split. So what will happen is it'll be like 55 degrees and it'll, it'll go into full. Both sides of condensers will be used. And then it'll be 54 degrees and it goes into split. And now you have one side of the condenser that's full of liquid refrigerant. And that liquid refrigerant gets pumped into your suction. And over and over again that happens. And it'll actually wash the oil out of your refrigerant, I mean out of your compressors causing oil failures eventually. Okay, and why does it do that? Because refrigerant is a solvent, right? And you gotta think about it. The oil dissolves in refrigerant, right? So it dissolves in your refrigerant and it goes out to your system and all your valves and blah, blah, blah. So if you have liquid refrigerant coming into your compressors, that oil is absorbing into it. It's mixing with the oil and it washes your compressors, clean out of oil. And as your compressor, that piston strokes up and down, every time it strokes up, it's just carrying oil, carrying oil and refrigerant, oil and refrigerant until the compressor pumps itself into a uh, oil failure. 
So that's another issue that's very specific to a springtime issue. Anyway, so that's kind of a quick list. And I think I might go to the pen and paper now and kind of maybe explain some of the theory with it. I'm not entirely sure what we're going to do with it, but let's find out together. I also wanted to mention it's worth mentioning for a high discharge situation. You see those little discharge? Maybe it's better with just my phone cam, like phone light. Come on, light. This flashlight's so aggressive, it's just like, ah, you know. Anyway, so sometimes it doesn't, it's not always programmed into the air. So just on a high discharge day, just going through and hitting all those buttons isn't a bad idea. Just want to mention that. I also just wanted to mention here that electricians sometimes they have to do certain things, you know. And so this is like a sub panel, right? So the unit that we're working on is directly above here. So the control voltage is located in this sub panel. So this sub panel is actually like right next to a, you know, to a deli. Like it's not in a machine room at all. I sorry, a bakery. Um, so this is worth mentioning when you're doing the power troubleshooting that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, that th there are these panels and sub-panels all around the store. Um, some stores, they're really good about locating them in, in just, you know, oh, they're all located in this nice little room. <sighs> if it's an older store, you know, in a, you know, an older building, you'll have these sub-panels everywhere throughout your store. So sometimes just look, like, where is your, you know, where is your condensing unit on the roof in, in reference to everything if you can't find um, the control voltage in your main panel. Just to show you, there's usually a, a panel. You see right there, rack B, okay, 50 amp, whatever it happens to be. Usually like a big panel like that. So there's another area where you can check, okay, if my power is no good, where's the panel? You know, go back to the source. Is my breaker tripped? Okay, so now we're going to go to the pen and paper really quick and just kind of maybe kind of go a quick overview. So we're not going to really, obviously the power is not something I really need to go over pen and paper that's self-explanatory. Actually, after I got done completing everything, I kind of thought to myself, well, I don't even think I need the pen and paper. I think I did it okay uh, without it, but I'm just going to do it just to be thorough. A low refrigerant, not something we're really going to go over, uh, but we're really going to mainly focus on oil failure. And then uh, high discharge and uh, high suction. And just a quick two-minute kind of snippet, look at it, and then maybe some of the extreme conditions. Um, and then I might actually, I'm thinking about releasing a theory video about specifically oil failures and oil systems where I'm going to model three or four types of oil systems and just kind of go through on the pen and paper how to evaluate them. So anyway, but we're just going to do a quick overview of what we just learned and kind of, you know, hopefully it'll help you in a rack down situation. All right, so the oil thing. So first on the oil was, you know, what compressor is on an oil failure. So obviously if all the compressors are on an oil failure, you probably have an issue with the oil, right? So if we look at our oil system, now I know this is kind of gobbledygook, it's hard to follow, but you know, we have our discharge that goes into our oil separator. We have our line coming out of the oil separator into the oil reservoir. We have a check valve, and then we have a line coming out of the oil reservoir into the compressors typically. And then uh, I forgot to draw it in, I'll draw it right now. Typically, we have an oil filter right here as well. Uh, so this is just a kind of a quick drawing that I did up to try to explain it. Oil filter. Okay. And um, so typically what you do for the oil, as I mentioned, is you check, see if any compressor has a specifically like one is filled up with oil. That's always your first. Then from there, you go over to your oil separator and you see... Is there oil in your oil separator? Because most of the time, so if you think there's a compressor filled up with oil and that's what's calling all of your oil issues, okay, you'll, you'll, you might see one that even let's say that one compressor just might be adequately full. It might be running, it might have enough, but all the others don't. You go to your oil separator and then it has two balls floating. Well, that can't be it. Okay, because your oil separator seems to have two balls floating, so more than likely it's something down the line, which I would I would go to the oil filter. But so you look at the compressor, if the compressor is filled with oil, your oil your oil uh, reservoir is empty, more than likely your issue is that compressor is hogging oil. Now if none of your compressors have oil, 
right? And your oil filters full, your oil reservoir is full. More than likely, your issue is this um, this uh, oil filter right here. So you just take a pressure differential from one side to the other, and if it's about you know anything above five psi, is definitely suspect to be the issue, um, right? So another case is let's say you come here, right? Your oil is empty. All the compressors are empty. There's no pressure differential across your your uh, filter, okay? And your check valve works. So you have to check. So I'll post a video of that below, but you check your check valve. It should hold about 20 PSI above the highest suction group, right? So we have this suction group that's 60 PSI, the suction group that's 20, and a suction group that's 16. So we would want the check valve to hold an oil reservoir pressure of 82 PSI, 82 to 92 PSI. Because some racks use 30, some racks use 25, some rack uses 20. But typically 20 to 30 is where we want this above our highest suction group for this style oil. So, um, but so if you find your oil reservoir is empty, your check valve works, your oil filter doesn't have a pressure differential across it and no, none of your compressors have oil in them. Now you look at this oil separator. So you should always be touching this oil separator line. If that oil separator's line is cold, more than likely your oil separator is clogged. So you would have to, some of them, they actually have filters. I'm actually gonna put in a, a, an interjection right now where we're gonna look at um, an oil separator and we're gonna look at the pressure differential across it. It actually comes with its own little little meter for it. And uh, I'm actually gonna show you one other thing which is a float screen. And I just wanted to show those two different things just to kind of give you a really good view of the oil system. Um, but more than likely a float screen would have to do with an individual compressor, right? So if that individual compressor is off an oil failure and everything else checks out in the oil system and that high suction is causing it, like you need that compressor to run, that is when you would then evaluate, okay, let's look at that oil screen. But let's go over and look at those two things and then we'll move on. I just wanted to show, throw this into the video uh, for the rock down video. Now this is a Temperite oil separator that actually has the pressure differential across it, a little gauge right here. So you can see this is the inlet side of the discharge. This is the outlet side, inlet side right there, outlet side, all the way up to there, you see? So this you can just do a quick check, no pressure differential. And over there, it has that whole 13, you know, 11, it looks like change it, 13, it looks like you're gonna have issues, okay? Just wanna throw that in there. This is a practical example of uh, an oil separator. Um, and I also wanna throw in there, you know, cause this is just a different kind of oil system, you know, just super quick, you know, run through warm oil line, you know, right there. Oil filter, oil reservoir, check valve, come out of there, float, okay? Uh, I just wanted to throw that in there. Well, actually, it goes from here to the reservoir, check valve, out of the reservoir, oil filter, and then into the floats, and those are all the floats. I thought I would show you, there's a float screen right here, you see? So, we're shifting this off of there. And that little brass fitting on top that comes off comes right up. Just a screen, kind of a thing to do with one hand. You see? And uh, you just hold it up to the light, and if it's black, it's dirty, and if you can see through it, it's okay. But typically, this wouldn't cause like a rack failure. This would cause like a one specific, um, you know, compressor to trip on oil. Just wanted to throw this in there to interject it, okay? If you come to a rack, okay, and I didn't address low refrigerant in my, uh, you know, pen and paper, because I have other videos that do it better, but I just wanted to mention, if you come to a rack, right, you look up here, there's no alarms, everything looks like it's running fine, okay, or it's just very quiet, only a couple compressors are running, but there doesn't seem to be any alarms, 
and you come over here to this alarm, you know, the controller, and you see that like everything's just like all everything's red, everything's in alarm, okay? In my opinion, the first thing you should do is lower refrigerant at that point, okay? That is kind of like a very obvious, so you know, check your sight glass, go up, check your receiver. I'm gonna attach those videos, but I just wanted to mention if everything seems fine, like all your compressors are running. You have your power. Your phase monitor is acceptable. Good to go, okay? Like, if all of that checks out immediately when you get there, and everything just like, I don't understand. All my compressors have oil. My oil reservoir is fine. And you just kind of look at it, and you see that everything is, you know, everything is failing. More than likely, it's low refrigerant, and you should check that. Just wanted to kind of give a clear clear somewhat instruction on that and i figured i would just plop it in here because like i said i'm just doing this video on the fly so we'll see how it comes out all right now that you saw those i think that this is a decent overview of the oil system so next up was the high discharge right so obviously for the high discharge you have um cleaning the condenser condenser fans those are your two 90 percent issues okay i've also had it where the hot gas uh, differential valve was stuck causing the discharge from this from the back part of the hot gas valve to increase to the point where it would trip on high discharge right so if all your normal things for instance is your condenser junk you know you know are all your ball valves open is your condenser clean or all your condenser fans running right and like you put on let's say you know worst comes to worst do not do this replace condenser fan motors but if you're going to lose the whole store you might have to put it on a sprinkler for a day sprinklers will destroy your condensers okay the minerals in the spring in the water the chlorine the fluorine all that garbage will get into that condenser and it'll destroy it a year or two of sprinklers and those condensers will be absolutely ripped dead okay are going to be calcified and put together so last resort if you're going to lose everything a hundred thousand dollars versus you know maybe a week in order to get the the fan that you need okay you got to evaluate that being a tech but anyway so if you see that okay i even put a sprinkler it's not a hot day and we still have head head pressure issues that's when you need to start evaluating like my oil separator so right here you could have an extreme, like let's say you have a 30 PSI pressure differential across this. Okay, that's 30 PSI higher here than it is over here. That can cause issues and that can cause your compressors to trip on high discharge. Okay, over here, your hot gas differential valve. If your hot gas differential valve is holding back improperly, again, you can have a high discharge over there. So come up to the split. Okay, is this is this feeding right to your condenser? Is it stuck in split? Right, that's a huge one. Is it did somebody manually turn it on to split for the winter and now it's the summertime and now you're getting high discharge? Okay. Is your split working properly? That's another one, okay? And so those are some things that you can kind of look into. Coming over here, right, we have our um, holdback valve. Again, you can check across that. Is your holdback valve artificially closed? Did somebody mess with it? Okay. Coming down further, your receiver, nothing you can really do there. Filter dryer, okay, filter dryer right there, okay? So, did some, is this filter dryer on your rack, does it have a, a, an extreme pressure differential across it? This might, and this might sound crazy, but I've actually come across a filter dryer with a 30 PSI pressure differential, all right? Um, I mean, so, that's very easily could happen, so somebody could have, uh, you know put in an epr and then you've got some got some metal flakes in it you know just years of neglect uh, i guess not easily happen but it happens um so everything on this side of it was 30 psi higher right which is causing it the trip on high discharge so those are all things for high discharge high discharge though mostly condenser is it plugged do you have all your fans and what's the weather like that's 99 percent of high discharge so next up we're gonna to go to low suction. So I broke it up into three main things. Are all the compressors working? Um, uh, and I think I put in touch the rack and subcooling. So 
I'm just going to go through that quick. And I'm also going to try to expand on my list when I po post it below. I'm also going to include my refrigeration racks explain video so you can get a more in depth of all this. And then I might actually re-release a theory only video eventually where I just go really like super detail oriented on every step on how to troubleshoot everything. But this is kind of like a, you know, quick and dirty if you're out at two in the morning, what I would typically do. So first off is all your compressors running. So if you have, let's say this 16 PSI suction group has a high suction, it, it, do, are all your compressors running? That's just first and foremost, are all your compressors running? And if one of them isn't, why, right? Same with, you know, any of these suction groups. Is all your compressors running? If not, why? And that would typically lead you to the oil problems that we already um, overviewed, but it could have been, could a compressor been off on high discharge because earlier in the day it was like a hundred degrees out. Could be, right? Could be all kinds of things. Could, could one of those, um, what are they called? Safeties be locking the compressor out even though it shouldn't be. So the safety's bad, right? So evaluating are all the compressors running is your first. Next up is touching the rack. So as I showed you in the video, you touch all, like every single suction line. So if you have a rack that's like this, that has all the lines coming out from uh, from the floor, you touch every single one of those, then you touch every single suction end bell, you touch every single discharge, you touch every single oil line, and you check, is everything blue? Is that cold or cool? Is everything red on the discharge side, is that hot? Is everything this yellow color and green is that like lukewarm right so discharge hot liquid lukewarm and suction cold if you find that something is warm that's not supposed to be warm or cold that's not supposed to be cold then you need to trace out where that is coming from is it a hot gas differential valve or whatever now this last one is the sub cooler so why does a sub cooler matter well if you're on a hot day and you're condensing temperature, your condensing pressure is okay. So let's say you're on an 80, 90 degree day and your condensing pressure is like, you know, like 200, 220, it's where it needs to be. Okay, it's nothing crazy like 325, right? And specifically, your low temp suction group is not satisfying and all three compressors are running, then you might wanna look into subcooler. Because what the subcooler does is it cools down this liquid refrigerant so when it goes out to your cases, it's more efficient for the, for the TXV to cool down your low temperature cases. Typically, so this would also be called an economizer, okay? So typically the way that this works is you're going to have a little line coming off of this liquid and then you're going to have another liquid line coming out and that liquid line is cooled by this liquid kind of crazy how it works. I'm going to attach my subcooler playlist below if you really want to dig into that. I think I have five videos on subcoolers. It's actually kind of a, a wild thing and how they how they fudge it to make it work. But short story, sir, short, long story short, if this subcooler doesn't work right, then this suction group is going to eventually kind of work its way up to a high temperature. But anyway, and then you have our special cases that we already discussed uh, previously. Anyway, I'm gonna edit that that guide, maybe make it a little bit more thorough, post it below, and then I'm gonna post, you know, racks explained, uh, how to troubleshoot any case, subcooler playlist, and uh, my oil system, checking your oil check valve, um, and the oil differential valves and what they do. I'm going to post those below just to kind of give you guys some more troubleshooting knowledge. But typically speaking, this is how I'd approach a rack down from just, you know, an outside, you know, just a general overview. I hope you learned something today. Uh, please like, subscribe and all that good stuff. And that's how you do it.